So, um, the next track starts. It's uh, called the Tower with Graphite on Scale. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, today I'm not going to talk about Prometheus. Uh, we're going to talk about Graphite instead and uh, what we are doing with it at Fito. Um, so, first, uh, let me present myself. Um, I'm working on Graphite with the Observability team at Fito. And before that, before I was working at Google on the table on Google. So yes, like the two previous speakers, I was also working with Google, but it's not a conspiracy. Um, so, uh, who here is running graphite in production? So still point a few people are using it, and that might be useful for you. Or I might know some things if we use later. Um, today we're not going to talk about the big, uh, about graphite, but about big graphite, which is uh, what you may want to use when you have a lot of data. Um, as you might have realized, um, graphite is a nice tool uh, to use when you just want to get a few metrics from a few servers or applications. Uh, what it does well is given a small or oh, a set of metrics, you can browse which metrics that you have and display uh, graphs with them. Uh, you can use graphs on top of it to build dashboards um, and yeah, basically graphics. Um, how does it work internally? It's important to dig into that to understand the rest later. Uh, graphite is divided in two components. Uh, the, the first one is carbon. That's the, the application that you send metric to. So all of your applications or servers are periodically, like every minute, sending metrics to carbon, which will then persist them to, to disk. Uh, the default database for carbon is called Whisper. Uh, and we whisper each metric, so a metric could be here, for example, was one free CPU zero user, plus then you have a text of value. So the metric is the first part, the name. So each metric in whisper will be one type, uh, which means that periodically your host is sending like one very metric, uh, one for each CPU, plus memory and everything, and carbon will receive them over TCP, UDP, or other things if you want to, and write them to separate types. Uh, so that's what it does. You also have carbon relay and carbon aggregator that are used to other things uh, before carbon cache, which is the component that is writing this. You can use that to, for example, duplicate the, the stream of metrics to two different clusters. On the aggregator, you can use it to do a sum over one minute or some things like that. But we won't go into this next class. So now you have an application that is sending metrics to carbon and it's written to disk. How do you make a graph out of that? Uh, the component that does that is Graphite Web. Uh, Graphite Web is basically a Django application that will read these files back from the file system and either display uh, some JSON that you could use somewhere, like a graph app, to display graph, or directly a PNG uh, that will be your graph. Uh, Graphite Web has a UI that you see when you use Graphite, which is the metric tree on the, the graphing area. And it also has, more importantly, uh, an API. The API has two main uh, endpoints. The first one is the one that is used to find metrics, uh, which is particularly useful when you want to autocomplete something, uh, in Grafana, for example. The second one is the one that will get your points, the points that you asked. Uh, in this example, you ask for the sum of my.metric.pointcard in the last 10 minutes, which will give you back the sum uh, for all these metrics in the last 10 minutes. So that's Graphite Web. Uh, and, and that's it. Uh, so how do we use Graphite? Uh, we, we are pretty big, uh, not as big as Google Amazon, but still we have six data centers, uh, 10 of thousands of servers and applications. Um, we just quite a lot of metrics, so it's an, uh, almost one million metrics now. Uh, we are ready to 220k metrics per second, and we write 800k metrics per second. And more importantly, uh, when we tried to scale graphite, we already had thousands of existing dashboards on alerts. And that's something that was written by 30 teams, uh, distributed over two continents. And you can't just say, okay, graphite doesn't work anymore, you will just switch to something else. Uh, that's impossible. So big constraints for us was we need to fix the fight and we'll see why, but we need to keep these dashboards on alerts working, and that's super important. 
Um, so we've seen the two components of Rafael, and that's the overall architecture. Um, if you have a simple setup, you will have just your application, carbon, Rafael web, and that's it. Uh, since we're pretty big, we can't really just do that. So what we've done is that in each data center, there are a few carbon relays that are listening for points on EDP from every application in this data center. And then sending these points over the one to the main graphite uh, cluster. And this main graphite cluster, there is again a relay that will distribute the points across multiple carbon caches and write that to the database, which will be then be read by graphite web. Um, so why do you want a central cluster? It's because when one of you, if your user wants to see how one service is behaving, you don't want the user to go to six different UI or anything, so you want to centralize everything in a single place, which makes things harder because you have bigger cluster to take care of. Um, also, that's a good other thing, but what do you do if one of your data center catch fire? Well, uh, you just have the second data center. So what we do is that the carbon relay that we have in every data center is just duplicating the traffic to two different data centers, and the user will just create any of these data centers that works currently. Um, um, yeah. So when we, what's wrong with that? Uh, that's the architecture that we already had uh, one year and a half ago, but it did not work so well for us. The, the software was working, but we were spending a lot of time trying to make it work uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, as we've seen, Whisper is writing one file per metric. But what do you do when you want to have two servers? You need to move some files somewhere else, to merge them back and everything, it's complicated. There are tools to do that. But it used to take us one week to do that, to add one server. And that's not a good use of time. Uh, the clustering at the time is better now, but at the time it was very naive. So let's imagine that you managed to shard all your data on 10 nodes, then one of them stopped answering, and you have a 500 for all your requests, because this one is not working. Uh, it's better now, but it used to be that, and that's not optimal, because the more nodes you have, the more likely to have you, have, you, you are to have one failing. Uh, and some queries that might look simple at the beginning will just overload all the nodes. Uh, and the thing that we have, as you've seen, that we had two different data centers, and sometimes one of the link was down, and when it was back up, we wanted to reconciliate all the data so that the user would not see a gap that they would not see before. And the tooling to do that exists, but again, it will take up to one or two days to merge everything back, even on SSD or very big machines. So that worked, but we did not really like spending all our time uh, working on that, on just Starting scripts. Uh, and the thing is that most of these issues have been solved by actual distributed databases. If you look at Cassandra, at React, at HBase, at everything, they've all already solved these issues, so why should we try to do it again when people have done it better than us already? Uh, in most of these, you have application, you have poor rates, you have a lot of tools. And you could just some so the idea is that at the time that we could just write the points to this database, get them back, and just be done with it. And most of them, we would most of them can just add one node on the database which just in the background represents the data and you won't see anything and it will work. It work. So that looked good and that's why we, we started the, the big graphic project. Uh, what it is exactly? So First, okay, databases have, have solved that already, but maybe, maybe there is somebody that had done that before with Perfect. And yeah, people have tried. Uh, and so, OpenCCD was another um, time series database that we could have used, uh, but there was no Perfect compatibility. Uh, we only have one, uh, even if it's big, uh, we have a single uh, HBase plus Arpito, and we want uh, some kind of data center uh, residency. Uh, there was Cyanide, which also used Cassandra, but at the time it used Elasticsearch, and we wanted uh, to have uh, to maintain only one database. Uh, also, it did not exactly behave like uh, the vanilla uh, graphite 
and as we've seen before, uh, thousands of dashboards and else, we want the exact same behavior. We don't want something to change, and uh, CNI do is not a good option for us. Uh, KerosDB uh, claimed that uh, there was compatibility, but again, it was not exact compatibility. And at the time, the project was using updated libraries, so it was not a good solution for Mercure. Uh, and we've looked at maybe 10 time series databases, and we found nothing that could cover our needs. So we started on working on something. So the goal was to get something like that. We get Carbon, again, to get metrics, and then we write to Cassandra, and then Graphite Web will get metrics from Cassandra. And the idea is that once one of the components becomes overloaded, we just want to be able to increase the number of instances without having to do anything more. So let's say that's, what does it work? Yeah. <coughs> so let's say that we need more uh, UI because uh, a lot of people are doing queries on an event is cached, which is a lot of CPU there. You can just add uh, one more UI or one more reference web, or a new Cassandra node, a new carbon cache, yet another Cassandra node. And the idea is that for the operator, you will just add a machine and that's it. We don't deal with the weekly rebalancing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the idea. How do you do that? How do you change Graphite's database to use Cassandra? Uh, the good thing is that Graphite 1.0 came with uh, plugins. Uh, on writing plugins for Graphite is not very hard. Uh, on the carbon, um, on carbon, you just need to support basically two creation. <laughs> or three version, one to check if the metric exists already in the database, another one to create the metric if it doesn't, and the last one to add data points in the database. So basically you have a Python class where you need to implement these three methods. And uh, for graphite web, you need to implement two things. The first one is to be able to find a list of metrics based on the globe. So let's say that the user wants my.metric.whitecard, you need to return the list of metrics that match that. And the second one is given one metric on a time window, return the points, uh, the points for this metric. And then graph files will take off all the rest. So, something by right, you don't need to implement this thing, and then you have uh, graph files on whatever, on Cassandra files. are the pairs of uh, timestamp and value, value being the uh, But by the small complication, you need to store these points at multiple resolution. Uh, you could store one point per second for one year, but that would take a lot of space. So what we do instead is that we store one point per minute for one week, then one per hour for one month, and when, then one per day for one year. And this way, people can have uh, long-term data, and it doesn't end up costing one petabyte of uh, uh, So that's the right path, you get uh, points, you write them. Uh, on the read path, you get a metric, a time window on your internal list of points. Uh, and it's important to optimize uh, the storage for the read path, which is not exactly as Brian said before, the same pattern as uh, when we write. Uh, the other thing that you need to do is to store the metric names to be able to browse there. And it's not only the metric names, it's also the metadata that you associate with metrics. So like the resolution, uh, when was the last time you wrote to this metric, you, you write from it, and that kind of things, uh, which are useful. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so we decided to go with Cassandra because we already had Cassandra too, uh, but we could have done that with React or any other uh, database. Uh, but it doesn't really work well for us. And now I will try to, to explain how you can do that with Cassandra. And it's not as simple as you would think. Um, so for points, uh, the main thing that you store in a time series database is the points. It could be simple, right? You could just have one table where you store a metric and a list of points. Uh, in Cassandra, that would be something like that. Uh, the partition key would be the metric then you would uh, have the timestamp, which is the clustering key, and then all the values. That works if you don't uh, have a lot of points for the same, uh, the same metric, and if you don't try to expire all the points. 
because if you try that, then you will have a lot of tombstones or everything I won't describe it that here now. But basically, that would have ended up uh, the breaking after one year, um, and we didn't want that. So we did something that is slightly more complicated, uh, but still not too bad. What we are doing is that instead of having one line per metric, we divide uh, the points in blocks, uh, kind of like Prometheus, where we are divided in blocks of two hours. Uh, we do that. We have something that we can configure, and we do one line with a certain duration of points, and we just create a new line after that, and we get another new line, which allows us, when we want to remove all points, just to remove the old line completely, and not remove cells inside this line, which is more efficient. Uh, another thing that we do is that we have one table per resolution, uh, which allows us to put some specific test settings, for example, for the points from today, we want to catch them more, and for the points for the last year, we might want to put them on a slower disk or something, or to use another kind of compression, so we have one table per resolution tip. Uh, and in the end, it looks like this. You have the metric, which is here with your ID, because you don't want to repeat the metric name all over the database. Uh, you have the start of the block, the offset within the block, and all the values. And that works pretty well. It's even more complicated than that when you want to add aggregation and want to have multiple clusters right into the same database, but that's the idea. Um, so, that's for points on that's fixed. You, we know to write, we know to read. Let me go back. So, when you write, you just add one line at the end, and when you read, you select the metric, uh, the, block that, the block that you want, and the range of offsets that you want inside that block, and that gives you a point that you want. Uh, but as you might remember, the plugin uh, system of Rafact also asks you to return the metrics matching one block. And for that, you need an index somewhere. Uh, basically, what you're allowed to do with Perfect is so you have components that are separated by points, and you're allowed to put wildcards on other things. Uh, for example, if you do fish.star.nemo.star, you would match fish.something.nemo.foo, uh, and you need to have an index where you can do that kind of thing. Looks easy, but when you have 100 million metrics, uh, that's probably 10 gigabytes or something. You can just do grep inside the bag. You need to do that for something smarter. Uh, the first idea was to use Elasticsearch. That would have worked well. And, uh, as a matter of fact, we have tools in the repository to import all the metrics in Elasticsearch. But it was hard enough to migrate to one database that we didn't want to learn how to use two of them. So we tried to, to do that in Cassandra directly. Um, Cassandra is not the best uh, database for indexes, but it has some support for them. Uh, starting with Fredos 5, uh, you have um, SASE, which is a secondary attached, uh, oh, SSW attached secondary indexes, which allows you to index some columns uh, onto prefix searches in, uh, in these columns, which was not for us. What we've done is that given the path, Let's say uh, Cassandra.qto.uptime. Uh, we will just split this path into components. So, in this example, the first component will be Qto, second one will be Cassandra, third one will be Uptime. And we will mark the end. Uh, so, the, yeah, the fourth one will be um, end marker. You can do that, or you can just store the length of the metric, but it's easier to do it this way. So, we split it into components in the table, and then we index each of them individually. Which means that if somebody wants to look for three dots of star, they just uh, look for any column where the component zero is equal to three zero. And because the length must be two, where the component two is the end marker. And that's as simple as that. And then you just express constraints on all the indexes. And Cassandra will write on you the intersections of all these constraints. Uh, yeah. You can learn more about that in the design doc uh, that is here on how SAS indexes work. 
So more example about that. Uh, for a simple metric, which is predefined, you can do that. Just express uh, the constraints of every component. That would be too good because you, since the metric can also be partition key, you can create a key on that. But for others, with stars that we've seen before, you just exclude the one where you don't know what would be there. So it's a white card. You don't, you don't add something on it in the query. And that would give you the results. Uh, the thing is that Graphite does not only support white cards, uh, it supports other things, like races, or it can be one of this character, or it could be characters from 0 to 9, or any character. And Sassy doesn't support that. So what we've done at the time is that each time it will be complicated, we would just replace the complicated thing by a prefix, if possible. So let's look at the first component, it's match. It's either matched by or matching. And here we will do select where part zero starts with match, and ignore the rest, and do that as a post filter. It's not super efficient, uh, but it works well enough at the beginning. Uh, later, what we did is that in this case, we will just ex expand the phrase, and instead of running one query where it starts with match, we'll say, OK, let's do one where it's matched by, and another when it's matching, and run both in parallel. And that's the second thing that we've done. And yeah, it worked pretty well. Um, so, as long as we had, well, I think it was 50 million metrics, that worked well. Uh, after that, it stopped working so well, and we sometimes spend multiple seconds finding metrics. It's not that long, but when you have 100 graphs to display, and each of them is taking 5 seconds, that's not really optimal. So, what we've done lately is that instead of using Sassy, we're using Lucene in Cassandra instead and just converting uh, this expression into a Lucene expression and letting Lucene do what it knows how to do. So we're still not using Elasticsearch. Uh, we don't need to deal with another database, but we have a better indexing, uh, indexing engine. And that's it for Cassandra. And then, so what can you do with this? Uh, so, yeah, we, we wrote that. Uh, it took us almost one year. And then we, we debug it. And it's now all the graphite clusters at Crypto are running with pre-graphite. Uh, it's pretty big. We have a lot of capacity and we are not using it uh, all uh, yet. Uh, it's absorbing 1 million uh, points per, per second on 20, no, 10, uh, 10 k rate per second, uh, which is a lot. What it's not yet good for is uh, efficiency. Uh, we still have 16 bytes per point after compression, uh, mostly because we did not try to optimize that yet. As you can remember, the most uh, pressing point for us is not to lose one week to add one node. And that worked, because here you can see that we are using 20 customer nodes per cluster. And at some point we realized that we partitioned wrongly the disk. Um, we just wrote a new chef recipe, deployed it, it reinstalled all the machines one by one, and we had nothing to do, uh, which was pretty nice. So that I didn't to spend 20 weeks to rebuild everything. Uh, okay. um, we don't have two clusters anymore, we have three. Because let's imagine that somebody is, running, is by mistake uh, doing drop key, key space on the customer cluster. We will lose everything because it's replicated. So we have two replicated clusters on one that is isolated, but we use as a fallback if something really wrong uh, happens to the two others. Uh, um, how can you use it? And it's pretty simple actually. You just pip install the graphite, uh, create the schema, uh, import your data from Whisper, set the storage finder to uh, the graphite in both graphite web and carbon, and you're done. Uh, that's not, not the most efficient to convert your whisper based cluster to a graphite one. But what you can do on top of that is just write to Cassandra, but read from both Cassandra and Whisper. There is a plugin that is uh, Graphite plus Whisper that you can use, and it will just merge the two, and you can just do that and then import in the background the data. And as soon as you're done, remove the whisper files and you go to Cassandra. So it's pretty easy to use it. Um, some links that you can use, uh, that you can read later if you want to know more. 
uh, what's most interesting here is the design doc uh, that we've written at the beginning, before doing the project, uh, that explains how it works and why we did things this way. Um, and roadmap, what should we do? Yeah, I'm talking about Prometheus here. Uh, we use Prometheus too, and we want our user to use hypergraphite or Prometheus, but to be able to find their, their Prometheus metrics in graphite and vice versa. So we built a tool which is called the Graphite Remote Adapter that will just uh, write metrics from Prometheus to Graphite and allow Prometheus to read back from Graphite these metrics. So it's kind of uh, transparent for users. And we want to optimize writes. Basically, uh, what Brian said before, you need a big write buffer. We don't have it currently because we, we add it, uh, it will increase the delay uh, between the injection of points and uh, on the time where a uh, user can read it, and uh, we need to work on that. We could do it, but it would take 3 minutes for a point to arrive. But it would also affect the CPU usage by 3, which is not that bad. Uh, and we need to optimize the read, uh, but it works pretty well. Uh, just a thing that might be interesting because it's a monitoring uh, talk. How do you make sure that you are monitoring? So we, we ordered a new graphite system, and we wanted to make sure that it worked. Uh, what are you supposed to do to make sure it works? So we did two things. Uh, we two things per component. For graphite web, we periodically, every minute, someone try try to fetch metrics, and we see if it succeeds or not. Uh, that's the read availability on the top left. Uh, and we also uh, uh, store the latency for the um, for the read path. On the write path, every minute we send points from every data center. And we check that they are right correctly, and if they don't, we mark them as loss. So we get the percentage of points that we are losing. We also use the timestamp as the value of these points, and we can find how long it takes for one point to get into the database. And that's what what is in the right uh, button, which is the time it takes to reach the database. So that's the SLA that we have, and basically we target like. 99% availability over uh, uh, 10 minutes. I think it's one second of latency. We don't want to lose too many points, so I think it's 0.5% of the points lost. Um, uh, the delay for the target delay is probably two minutes. After that, we get a page. Um, um, yeah. Any question? So thank you very much. We have three minutes left, so please stay seated and be quiet so that we can hear the questions and answers. Uh, first, thanks very much for, for, for that uh, presentation. Really cool with using Graphite again, which once was available and then uh, didn't work. Um, I just wanted to know, did you take a look at the uh, stuff the guys from Brooklyn.com did, like the uh, carbon C relay and the carbon silver and all that stuff? So we, we talked to them, uh, and when we talked to them, it looked like what they did as a lot of dependencies and did not behave like, exactly like any other graphite, so we did not go with it. But if you don't have as many as existing that part as we do, uh, that's probably something that works for you. And I think uh, Rain Tank also has um, another solution, Metric Tank, that works well, but it doesn't behave exactly like uh, the negative effect. Hello. So I have one question. You mentioned 20 terabytes of data points, which seems yeah. amazing. The first question is how many distinct time series that represent? And do you have any way of quantifying how many time series are written but never fit? A single time. So yeah, that's 20 terabytes before application. Uh, it's more like 80 uh, because we replicate to us well, four times. Um, and that's 100 million time series. Uh, and we do know which ones are being used because um, we mark the last time the time series was read. So each time there is a read, no. Once Sometimes we mark it because if you don't want to do it every time you write, you, you write it. But we do mark that, and we have the timestamp, uh, this timestamp. So we are not doing the stats yet, but we could do them. And we could try to maybe uh, some advise teams to stop sending these metrics because they are useless. Yeah. 